these recordings of interviews and conversations with the artists participating in the popular image exhibition at the Washington Gallery of Modern Art were made during March 1963. On this side of the record, we will hear in the order of their appearance, Jim Dine, George Brecht, Jasper Johns, Roy Lichtenstein, John Wesley, and Robert Watts. Like I say, I mean, it's obviously that I'm interested in objects. You know, yeah, if we want to use that word again, I mean, obviously, you know, yeah. I am interested in them. But I'm interested in them like I'm interested in a big piece of paint as an object, too. Yeah. You see, so I mean, I mean, I'm not saying that when I made the tie paintings or, or when I made um, tool paintings or when, I, or when I make a room painting that the objects don't mean something like what they are. Like that medicine chest certainly has the connotations of the medicine chest. Yeah. I can't take away the literariness of that. But I do think that it's more important. It becomes, as I get involved with the picture, more important as a rectangle than as a medicine chest. Yeah. You see what I mean? So that, so that eventually it's nice to start with some outward idea and turn in rather than starting with some inward idea and turn out. Because that, for me, it never works, you know, that inward idea. It's always, it's got to be an outward idea that, make, that allows me, it's, it's the same reason that I draw, do all my drawings after I've done the painting. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like yeah. starting, uh, starting fermenting with an outside idea and then making the big statement in the painting. And then really the final culmination of the inward statement is the drawing, since it's an intimate act. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, and, and yeah. that's what really interests me. The object or the idea yeah. becomes the catalyst, the real idea, the bathroom, yeah. you know, the connotations of toilet paper, toilet paper. But once, it's, once I've decided to use it, toilet paper is no more than a daub of paint. I mean, it's a spot, it's a form, it could be a, a rectangle like Mondrian, you know. I really think that I come out of, you know, a tradition that has to do with Mondrian and Barnett Newman rather than out of de Kooning, say and uh, Picasso say, so, you know, I mean, if there's a tradition where people come out of things, you know, I think I evolved more from that, from Roger van der Weyden and Jan van Eyck and that sort of thing, you know, um, uh, you know, like this, the painting that, that has the uh, sink in it, the black bathroom number two, that really is just a draw. It's like a, a drawing. That, that thing works as a negative space and, uh, but, but nobody gets past that sink. You know, so nobody wants to get past that sink. They want to harp on that sink and wash their hands in that sink, and they want water to come out of it. And then art doesn't work that way. It, art is not a game. There are all these other considerations. After the whole business, the whole crap of getting them all together, you know, finally they are just there, and that's what they are. You know, four rooms. The saw has five blades. You know, yeah. these are pearls. You know, that is a black shovel yeah. with a long handle. Yeah, you know, that kind of stuff. It, it's a, yeah. It's nothing more. It, you know, uh, <clears throat> people certainly have the right to make it any more they want, but that's what they bring to it. In a way, everything that has happened over the last 30 years has finally gone, both in society and in painting, mm -hmm. has gone to the point where it is natural to do a thing like this. Not only natural, but, it, I mean, it, there's just no room for the contrivance. No, that's yeah. right. Yeah. It just can't, it can't exist, because you get pushed so far that it has to be natural or else it, it's fake. I mean, it's so obviously so that no one can kid themselves. Yeah. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's, it, it, it becomes like politics. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, yeah, but, but there has to be like, you, like people in the 30s, there are certain intellectuals in the 30s, say, in America, confused liberalism with communism. You know what I mean? They, they, refu they confused it. it but, but those are the affectations that went with that age, somehow. They were, they were like aesthetic as affectations. They have to do with, uh, now, I mean, the, the, there's, the thing is that, the, the, that if someone wants to be a communist now or something like that, or want to be a fascist now or a democrat now, you know, it's like they'd have to be really that. There's no room to crap anybody about it, you know. You really have to be what you're going to be. And it's the same thing with objects. I mean, you know, it's the same reason to use it. It's the natural thing to do because any other thing, uh, I mean, like, uh, like gently dusting the, or touching the canvas with a brush to uh, delineate a washstand, you know, is so crazy and now. It's just a lot of crap. Yeah. I mean, th there's nothing that can be more real than the real thing. Yeah. You know, I just don't think so. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. You can't get away from it. No. It's unbelievable. Everywhere you turn, yeah. you know. So that what it ends up is my studio looks like 
my paintings. Yeah. You know what I mean? And then you sort of, and you, you can't get away from it so much. This is why I keep them on canvases. Yeah. It's the last vestige of unrealism, you know, of unreality, yeah. the canvas, you know. So, un, it's so it's so unrealistic to put that wash tan on that canvas. I have to do it. Yeah. Otherwise, there is no more art. You could destroy it, you know. <laughs> you don't like to be called an artist, do you? Wait, wait. Can we have two more beers? Yes. Yeah. I mean, I don't have any control over what people, uh, you know, choose to think or say about what I do. So I, uh... So if one, someone chooses to say it's art, it's all right to me. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the point is, I guess, that, that it's really not, uh, really not an interesting question. No, no, <laughs> especially not to me. Yeah. Well, I don't, uh, you know, I don't feel like much of what I do, if anything, uh, comes from art. And, uh, and I don't feel that uh, what I do necessarily something, a contribution. And, uh, there's a sort of equivalence of, there's a sort of equi equivalence that I see in, in what happens, uh, like uh, life is just a sort of series of events, one after another. And uh, one time you're, uh, maybe brushing your teeth, and another time you're washing a shirt, and another time you're making an arrangement of objects, an arrangement of events. And uh, one doesn't seem more important or special than another. The events that happen in the theater are no more important or significant than the ones that happen anywhere else, on the street or in my home or the subway. But but by by uh, taking the events and, and sort of making them your own, you do make a choice. You do. Uh, you no, I don't feel them. In a way. Well, uh, in terms of having taken some taken some action, I don't feel that that I own the action. Or if I make an object, I don't feel I own it necessarily in some special way. I don't feel it's any more mine than anyone else's. So the other action is still on the level of brushing your teeth. Right? Yeah. So you, you uh, but obviously if you do paint the chair, or <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, that, that's uh, that's uh, fading away now. Like yeah. the latest pieces I've made are, n are uh, not specially treated. The optics are simply brought together uh -huh. uh, temporarily. And uh, they're not uh, they're not treated in a special way. They're used just as they came to me. Yeah. And, uh, they're not they're not even fixed. So that uh, each piece uh, can be changed by me or by others. Just through circumstances in general. So the last couple of pieces, which I don't think you've seen yet, uh, look are much less easily taken as art objects than things that I've done before, where I say painted them white. There are differences technically, and there are differences uh, in what a, a different technique can be used to mean. So if you do one thing, and then you do another thing, that's different, obviously different. You tend not to be able to attach the same meaning to those two things. The, the early paintings of mine seem to me to have been involved 
partly with what we were talking about earlier, accuracy, and uh, questioning whether there was such things, so that the paintings tended to be a sum of corrections in terms of painting, in terms of strokes, so that there are many, many strokes and there are many uh, Everything's built up on a very simple frame, but there's a great deal of, of work in it. And the work tends to be uh, to correct what lies underneath constantly until finally you quit and you say, that's, that's this one. It seems to me that uh, the work I do now is more concerned with I don't know what's more concerned with it. It is less concerned with accuracy. It's taken, since there didn't seem to be any such thing anyway, it was never achieved. Uh, more recent work of mine seems to be involved with the nature of various technical devices, uh, not questioning them in terms of, of their relation to the concept of accuracy. It seems to me that the effect of the more recent work is that it is more related to uh, feeling or emotion or let's say, let's say emo em emotion or uh, emotional or erotic content in that there is no superimposition of another point of view immediately in terms of a stroke you know, of a brush. <coughs> so that uh, one responds directly to uh, the physical situation rather than to a complex physical situation which uh, immediately has to be re uh, resolved intellectually, so it seems to me the earlier paintings would tend to appear to be more intellectual yeah. because, because of this, because yeah. uh, everything's very close and uh, variations are slight and the lines that everything follow are very clear. So that one has a, a dual situ on, uh, only a dual situation, I think, in the early paintings. You question whether it is a painting or whether it is what is being represented. Yeah. I think in the more recent paintings, you don't question that. You know what is what is painting, and you know what the objects are that are involved, and you may or may not know what the sense of it is. That's yeah. so your own business. They're also less arbitrary. However, the, I think the current idea would be the opposite. Because they have no references outside of the actions which are made. The, other, the earlier paintings refer to specific uh, designs or lines or whatever, which had to be dealt with, and the uh, liveliness of the painting tends to be what I called earlier uh, corrections, a very complex set of corrections in relationship to these lines, whereas the more recent works don't 
گرفتم پردن این باب بود این در ایزن در ایزن در کانسپنت اتمت تو دو سمتنگ اوور این اوور این اوور این اوور این اوور این Like draw a straight line, you draw a straight line and it's crooked and then you draw another straight line on top of it and it's crooked a different way and then you draw another one. And eventually you have a very rich thing on your hands, yeah. which is not a straight line. If you can do that, then it seems to me you're doing more than most people. <laughs> <laughs> It's very difficult to know oneself whether one's doing that or not. Whether you mean what you're doing. And there's the other problem of, of, of uh, the way you, the way you, the way you do it, and whether sometimes you do more than you mean, or you do less than you mean, and that. Uh, It's very good if you can establish a language where it's clear that that is what you're doing. Yeah. That you do what you need to do. A few of those, you saw the one of um, the Donald Duck and Mickey Mouse yeah, that I did and on the raft. Yeah. And um, the Popeye and Bluto one in uh -huh. the kids' room. And uh, this. Uh, one of Wimpy being yeah. uh, knocked out. And then I probably did no more than five or six of those and then went into the others, which mm -hmm. I've been with. Um, I think I went from there, actually, I think I went from there into objects more directly because I did the rotor broil yeah. and those things, the bathroom. Mm -hmm. They weren't really cartoons at the beginning. Uh, of course. Yeah. yeah. And then from there to. Well, I still I still do objects and yeah. I do. Um, Except for your Picasso thing. I do the Picasso thing. Uh, then I do cartoon things of war and love. I think I'm kind of interested in doing um, very emotional subjects in a very <laughs> emotional way. <Yeah. laughs> the, the oh, I This <laughs> the technique is so uh, unemotional and so uh, planned and cerebral up to a point that, and the subject matter is so uh, the subject matter is so uh, emotional yeah. that uh, well, I like the contradiction there because in a way that's a contradiction that exists in, in comic strips which are supposed to bring tears to your eyes and, and yet there's almost no emotion possible in the, in the execution of it. At least it's not that kind of emotion. And uh, I don't mean that the things I'm doing are cerebral, really. They, they, uh, I, don't, I think that the uh, placement of a part has to be uh, a felt kind of placement. It has to do with, uh, in order to unify the thing, there has to be an emotion connected with it. But the emotion is... Uh, harnessed kind of by a technique which is uh, which appears to be unemotional yeah. uh, probably it's the same uh, thing as classical art would be it would instead of using say um, it has the same feeling maybe in some ways that even if the themes in classical art can be emotional but they don't appear to be emotional it is like emotional painting the other parallel with that is that the The kind of thing I am doing is um, repetitive of similar forms in the same way that uh, classical art is, uh, or um, art that uh, harks back to Greek and Roman art, the Renaissance art, and uh, the art of David and Ang, which is the, uh, it's going back to models of a kind of ideal subject matter, and so is mine, but then it's not going to the same models. That, that a more, of course, the commercial <laughs> subject matter. That's what we left this bum here. We're in a, uh, in a area where there's
this stuff. You know, get many uh, yeah. uh, bumps from uh, the bar. Yeah. Uh, homeless vagrant men who roam the streets and they beg and they sleep mm -hmm. in hallways okay. and they yeah. drink in hallways and they they vomit in hallways. <laughs> they live in hallways and there was one living here when we moved in. And because of the child and everything, uh, we decided we had to get rid of him. It was very difficult. Yeah. And, uh, I, I got a pistol. Nice. <laughs> Martin, no, no, you did it. <laughs> I threatened his life. Really? Yeah. Did I tell you about Marty? Yeah, you told me about Marty. Yeah, Marty. 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 It was Marty's idea, yeah, to get a pistol. He's always paying any attention to me. And I go downstairs and I say, listen, you can't live here. Because you, you know, he was sleeping in a hallway. You can't live in a hallway. You, you can't. And he say, yeah, yeah, I'll move out someday. And, uh, and I realized he wasn't taking me seriously. Nobody else was either. Nobody was taking me seriously. And then Marty suggested, being in New Jersey, there are pistols in New Jersey, and uh, he loaned me the pistol. And so I brought the pistol here, and I, I went down one day, and I showed it to the bum. You know. Yeah. And I said, look, George. Is his name George? <laughs> <laughs> it was. His name was George. I said, look at this, George. You've got to move out. And he looked at the pistol, and he's very much impressed. And he started calling me Mr. And he moved out within the week. And I helped him move with the pistol. <laughs> and, uh, and gee, I thought that was great. And I talked to Marty about it later, and he said, of course. He says the pistol is making a great difference in your career and everything about you. And you're not painting for nothing anymore because you've got, you know, you've got something now. And, uh, so, oh, I don't want to show it to you. It, it's, it's so effective somehow. Anyway, I showed it to my barber, yeah. and uh, the barber he used to just cut my hair, and he would talk about you know things around the neighborhood. And once I showed him the pistol, he started talking about me. Yeah. Yeah, well, I didn't tip him anymore after that. You know, I just showed him the pistol once, and he cuts my hair very quickly and very well. And, um, <laughs> And so then later I showed it to my grocer, who was never taking me seriously. You know, I go in, I have to wait in line. Other people, would, uh, you know, yeah. be there. You know, they buy a pack of cigarettes and they push it in front of me and everything. And I stand there like a dumb Californian or something. But I showed him the pistol one night. You know, and I said, "See?" And he looked at the pistol. And uh, now, you know, I buy the beer and everything else I buy there. And I walk up, and he says. John, come right here, you know, and I move right up, and I pay for what I got, and he bags it up right away, and I walk out, you know, and I've never had to show him the pistol again, you know, it's just, it's just one of them. So anyway, this was working out very well, but still time I'm painting, and uh, I even had photographs taken of, the, taken of the painting, and I was showing them around to a few dealers and things like that, and uh, absolutely no one was taking the paintings very seriously, and Marty suggested that I show the pistol to a dealer. And so I did. I went uptown and I took the pistol and I showed it to a dealer. I won't tell you which one. But uh, the dealer looked at the pistol <laughs> and he said, I like your paintings very much. I'd like to come down and see them. And that's what I sort of had in mind. Mm -hmm. And I never showed him the pistol again. And he came down. And since then, I've been getting such reaction from the paintings and people like them very much. <laughs> he had the pistol cap and runs. <laughs>
This side of the record begins with an interview with Tom Wesselman and Andy Warhol by Henry Gelsaler. Then we will hear Klaus Odenberg, Jim Rosenquist, and Robert Rauschenberg. Where are you? I'm uptown. Did you come uptown much? Well, first thing I think of is, I just read a review in Arts Magazine of my show, and I said I, I was uptown. The Tom Wessel. Yeah. And I said I was uptown, that was kind of bad. Like, I shouldn't be here. You think it's bad for artists to come uptown? No, I don't think so. You think it's bad for collectors to go downtown? No. Uh, I sort of enjoy when collectors come downtown. There should be some place like Midtown where they could meet, like a gallery or something. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> no, I don't think they want to meet. I shouldn't meet. No. They should never meet each other. No. There was uh, an opening tonight at Dick Smith's paintings, and you had a painting there, and it had a door attached to it and a coat hanging on the door, and people got very confused. Does that amuse you, or does it disturb you? Neither. It, it, it amused me in my studio when people were there for half an hour, and we talked about the piece, and they commented about the radiator, and they finally realized the radiator was a part of the picture. Uh, and then as they were about to leave, they said, the door isn't a part of the picture, too, is it? Were they attached to the thing? Were they attached? Yeah. yeah. The people or the door? The whole thing. Oh, this is Barbara Stella's going to say hello. Hello. That's Barbara Stella. Uh-huh. <laughs> I'm hanging my coat on the door. I'm on the door? Oh. I thought it was part of the I think the, the piece must be a total success. <laughs> total success. Your birthday's coming up. Yeah. You're 32? 32. 32. Tom Wesselman's going to be 32, and this is 1963, in case this thing is ever found. I think it's terrific. I think we've got to bury it. Uh, it's going to get buried, aren't you? Tom Wesselman, Okay. Uh, have you had enough? Have you had enough? I can't remember. Where are we? Uh, at a party. I asked Tom Wesselman, this is Andy Warhol we're talking to now. I asked Tom Wesselman a lot of questions about uptown and downtown, but uh, they weren't very interesting. That's Andy, you can't think of anything to say. 
Well, that's my minute, isn't it? Come on. I don't know what to say. We don't put that say, John. This is John Chamberlain, who's not in the show. Hi, John. <laughs> How do you do? <laughs> Oh, there's no background music. Yes, there is. You, you can't hear it on the One direction, though. Picks oh. up everything. Uh, I'm not supposed to be in this much. You're supposed to be the artist. Oh. <laughs> do you know what you're doing? No. Do you ever know what you're doing? Would you have an idea of what a painting's going to look like before you do it? Yes. Does it end up looking like you expected it to look? No. You are surprised? No. That's wrong with that. Wrong with that. No, I'm asking me something that's... Obvious. How can you interview an artist who can't talk? <laughs> you can interview an artist silent ticket. for a week? No. I mean, a minute? Talk something. What do I have to say? Ask Tell us something more. What are you wearing? Uh, two boots, <laughs> a pair of brown pants, a black, black jacket, a shirt that has one button, a coat that I got in Hong Kong, how long are you in Hong Kong? Uh, enough to get uh, a shirt. Was the coat finished, or did you have to have it sent? It was sent. So only that long enough to have it measured? Yes. Hey, class Oldenburg. Of voyeurism? Yeah. This is class Oldenburg, who's in a new form of uh, <laughs> <laughs> You just walked away. I think that's enough. That's enough. What does the store represent to you in the sense when you says that you change from the street to the store? What, what uh, people come into the store and what is it? <coughs> well, the, 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 the street was the street was a um, an outside form, and it was a um, a uh, deliberately non-coloristic form and uh, a linear form and an extended form, an infinite form. But then the store is entirely different. It's inside. It's limited. It's full of color. It's um, it's warm. The street's cold. You know. I mean, people people when they walk down the street, they look into the store and they don't look very much at the street. The yeah. street the street is really a uh, reality, and the store is sort of unreality. The store is sort of idealism. And I guess I play with idealism. I give, I mean, the way advertising plays with idealism. You know. Yeah. I mean, nobody ever can make a cake look the way it looks in the advertisement. You know. and I mean, it's, it's a kind of a dream. You know. So the store is a dream compared to the street, which is uh, reality. Part of the store is, is my fascination with uh, very simple-minded notions of what's beautiful. And... Uh, which are sometimes accidental as a result of mechanical processes and so on. It's all that people have. In, in another way, um, it's a fascination with the limitations of beauty as far as people are concerned, you know, uh, in a mass society, and uh, what they have to work with you know, uh, in a city mass society. So uh, my, uh, my story, you see, when you walk down Orchard Street, it, at one time, it, it, it's, it's a very idealistic thing because it's very beautiful, you know, in a funny kind of way. And yet it's very disappointing because all this stuff is created by machines and it's really very dull, you know. But what people see into it is more maybe than what's there. So I'm working with uh, a sort of stunted uh, beauty. Like what I, I, I'm against the notion that there is a world of art and then a world of real things. And that one thing has to be brought out of the world of real things into the world of art to matter, see? But I'm more inclined to put the thing somewhere halfway between the real world and the world of art because there's... Um, nothing is interesting to me unless it's halfway, see? Unless it's very ambiguous, you know? Unless it's uh, a little bit inside, a little bit outside. The, st the beauty of the store was that it was almost a real store, see? But it wasn't quite a real store. And that this confusion existed so that when people went away, they saw the real things with half of the confusion, you see, of seeing my things. You know, it works both ways. Like, artists can come and say, well, this is not art. This is a hamburger. And other people come in and say, well, this is not a hamburger. It's art, you see? Yeah. So that it, it's in the middle ground. And that's where I want to be. 
I find it very hard to separate my theories from my action. You know, I, I don't, uh, it's very hard to see exactly what I do when the crucial act of doing comes, because that's an arbitrary act. And up to that point, uh, there are all sorts of theoretical possibilities which may seem better, you know, or I'll be more respectable somehow. I think that the act of art is a very arbitrary and very um, dogmatic act, you know. And uh, I think what I do is I take possession of the object. And uh, I only allow as much of the object in uh, as I want. I, mean, I don't, I really make a possession of the object. You know? So that when I uh, use the object, I use it on my own terms, and it tends to have a life which is my own life. It tends to be a projection rather than a, an elimination of myself. So, um, I mean, that's, that's what I think is true. Now, I have all kinds of uh, notions about what I do. And I, I would like to treat the object um, as if it were outside of me, and as if I knew what it was, and as if I uh, could grasp it outside of myself, as if I could give it its own um, existence. But I have, I have this feeling that even when I look at an object, I'm doing something creative. It's a creative act. And I have a feeling of total relativity in regard to the object. And, and, uh, uh, no notion of its actual existence. Um, so that um, I'm inclined to accept the, uh, the notion that I have of it, you know, as the only possible notion. But then I do amend that a great deal by other people's notion. I tend to, I tend generally to regard the, this is hard to understand, I tend generally to regard the, everything that's seen as subjective, that is all reality as subjective. And yet, to distinguish between my perception and, say, another person's perception. Uh, that is to say, the glass that I'm looking at will look one way to me and one way to you. I, I, I had an opportunity in that job to see large areas of, of uh, color uh, reacting against one another and uh, reacting for one another. Uh, on, on the large outdoor signs, and uh, I worked on. Uh, I'll see you there. I I worked on uh, uh, the Astor Victoria billboard in Times Square many times, and at times we would paint uh, an area uh, 30 feet high by 100 feet long white and right directly below that we would paint it uh, bright red and to to uh, lower yourself down on the scaffold to the area where the say the line between the red and the white was at the bridge of your nose or well, everything beneath would be red and everything above would be white and uh, colors having all that color saturation in front of your eye would change other things i would turn around and look at the look at times square or look at the view look somewhere else and everything would be green uh, so it'd be very confusing at times you wouldn't know if you were half a day you wouldn't know if you were painting with cream color a gray color a yellow gray a blue gray uh, a leg maybe uh, may take on a gradual curve and it's it's uh, it's exciting to have a line start in the vicinity of your 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 head or your your body and then trail off to where you can't see it any longer and just trail in a gradual and know that it's a very long line and um and know it's there but but see that you can see that it sort of goes to some uh, immediate infinity Another time, I dropped a uh, gallon of purple on 47th and uh, 7th Avenue, 
and had purple all down the side of the Mayfair Theater and a big <laughs> splat of purple paint right on the sidewalk. What happened? Oh, we ha I went down there with uh, about five pounds of rags and started <laughs> wiping up, <laughs> wiping up the, the purple paint. I was wiping purple for all morning. I sprayed ga gasoline tanks white, and I sprayed them silver. An amazing thing happens with white and silver paint. If, you sp if it's a little bit windy, <clears throat> you spray white paint, the white may carry, the, the white paint may fly through the air two or three blocks and land on someone's black car. Yeah. You know, silver paint has, I think, has gone seven or eight miles. Really? The silver paint has been carried by a wind and it's gone seven or eight miles and landed on people's cars. Well, one time we were working and I painted this, le this letter. It was about a 10 foot high word but from the top to the bottom of the letter. And when I got through painting, it was red on white. Uh, it was a mistake. It was in the wrong place on the sign. So I had to paint it two feet lower. So I had uh, Marty, my helper, wash everything down with red, <laughs> with benzene. I was covered with red, and he was covered with red from head to foot, and we were scrubbing red paint off white. And it was a beautiful mess. <laughs> and uh, finally, after getting most of it off, I could lower the thing, the whole thing, two feet. I think the white paintings and the black paintings happened simultaneously, and they were the results of a lot of indoctrination about function of color and of form, and which for a lot of that's a scientific fact, like that a red makes a green look greener if it's close to it. And I so involved in the material separately that uh, I didn't feel as so or well, I didn't want painting to be simply an act of, of employing one color to do something to another color when my response to it was much more direct than that. that uh, the reds I liked were the reds I looked at, and they just looked red. That, uh, the same thing was true about a blue or a green, but all of these materials in isolated. And so I was very, I was very hesitant to uh, just arbitrarily design forms and select colors that would achieve some preconceived uh, result. Because uh, it seemed to me that I didn't have any ideas that would support that. I had nothing for them to do, so I wasn't going to hire them. I was more interested in working with them than I was their working for me. And I've always thought about materials as though um, whatever I use, whatever the results are, however I've used them, that the method was closer to a collaboration than, than um, these materials being in the service of art. And from the very beginning, I've indulged in the um, ordinary fact that whatever you choose to do is uh, 
what people have to deal with. So that whatever I made as a painting um, would either have to be accepted as a painting or rejected as a painting. And uh, that's the fate that, uh, that any picture has. In the white paintings, I always thought of them as being um, not passive, but very um, like hypersensitive, so that uh, any situation that they were in, one could almost look at the painting and see how many people were in the room by the number of shadows cast or what time of the day it was. Like a, a very limited kind of clock. And with the black ones, I was interested in the complexity without their revealing anything. The fact that there was lots to see, but not much showing. And it wasn't, um, they didn't have the familiar aggressiveness of, of art that says, um, here it is whether you like it or not. And then I became disturbed with the, the fact that uh, the outside assumptions, the prejudices uh, around the, around the colors being black or white and being monochrome, the people thought that the, uh, that the black was people thought that the black was uh, about old and burned and tarred and they thought the white was about n negation and uh, nothing uh, some philosophy of nothing and so that they were misrepresenting themselves and I had already had the experience and so the next move was obvious to try some other color and I picked the hardest color I found to work with which was red and uh, then I became conscious of the gaudiness of red as uh, the idea was not that uh, that gaudiness is, is a particular viewpoint so I tried to find a way that a kind of color that uh, wouldn't have any of these um, local interpretations and I began to notice that the experience of uh, walking on the street or uh, being in the theater or around any group of people that uh, the mass, no matter how colorful it was, uh, didn't, uh, never looked tonal and nothing was particularly outstanding that someone might be wearing a very bright tie or, uh, 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 but uh, somehow it was absorbed because all of these things were, even though they were individually brilliant, were accepted in a, um, content and so I that uh, made them both independent and neutral so I 
tried to uh, get some feeling of pedestrian color into the paintings then. And I think after a while I began to relax about that and uh, my, I didn't have to be conscious of it, that my habit was, uh, you know, I'd lost the habit that, that I had been educated to. And uh, then it was other materials that um, began to interest me. Well, in the red paintings, I had already used light bulbs. And that was after observing that uh, paintings looked very different in different kinds of light and that if you used an enamel, if you did a painting mostly with enamel paint that sent it to a gallery or, or someone took it and hung it in their home, they would try to hang it so, the high, so that there was no glare on that surface, mm -hmm. which is unrealistic because uh, that is a shiny surface and it was uh, lying about what the picture was made of and so I thought that if I incorporated light bulbs in it, that the painting had its own source of light too, that it would be more related to the, the room that it was in using its light. And the, that getting the room into the pictures uh, was important because I've always been, uh, felt a little strange about the fixedness of a painting fact that after the paint has stopped running and uh, the canvas is dry, that uh, the only changes uh, are really very subtle and not, uh, they're not perceptible unless you have known the picture before. That's anything short of some kind of molesting or uh, destruction. And so the use of mirrors and um, putting uh, open areas in the painting for the wall, which would change from time to time, from place to place, to come through and be part of the active image was a way of counteracting that, that kind of stillness that I uh, found not... Um, I didn't find anything in life to relate to that.